Hello. I am here to show you how to use that new typewriter you just bought, or inherited, or were gifted from someone's garage. Typewriters are not that complicated, but they do require some things to know about them, and they take a while to become proficient at. So let's begin. Ugh. All right, to show you the parts of the typewriter, I'll be working off of this list personally. Uh, I just typed it up. It's all of, the, all of the different controls and the major parts you need to know for operation. It looks intimidating, but it's not really. Once you get to using it, it's pretty intuitive. There's just a lot of different parts. To begin showing you how to use a typewriter, I'm going to start with this 1950 Remington. Uh, this typewriter actually belonged to my grandparents and my grandmother could type 130 words a minute on it, which is really cool. This one has a lot of family history for me. I'm also starting with it because it has pretty much all of the conceivable features any normal typewriter is going to have that you might encounter. This, like, this is the most specked out most featured typewriter you'll encounter. So it's a good place to start because you probably won't encounter anything that isn't on this typewriter. Um, to start with, I'll just do a little demonstration and I'll explain like the first mistake that people make when they try out a typewriter is they don't use the right kind of pressure on the keys. Um, this typewriter is particularly picky about what type of pressure you use. What you want to do is you want to peck. Peck the keys firmly, but it has to be a peck. You don't press. You don't press the key hard. Because what I'll see people do is try to do that. Press. You end up with this really faint type and it skips spaces and it doesn't work. Conceivably you could damage it if you were just trying to press really hard to get the letters to show up. You want to peck, peck. Uh, and then once you do that, you get nice dark type. Most of these keys are pretty explanatory from, a, you know, if you're used to typing on computers. One thing that is going to be different is how the shift works. Shift works the same as a computer, but the cat, the shift lock is a, you know, is a separate button, but on every typewriter I have ever used, at least, you release the shift lock by pressing shift again. Um, this typewriter is kind of cool because it has a shift, loft, shift lock on both sides, which like, honestly, I wish computers had. So that's the first difference. The next one is backspace, is literally just back a space. Uh, you type something out, type, Backspace, it literally just moves back a space, and if you want, you can type something different over that. And then you just end up with letters stacked, like a double exposure on film. This typewriter has a feature that I haven't seen on any others, but I'm sure exists elsewhere. You want to make sure you're only hitting one key at a time. If you overlap keys, at some point you'll end up with two of them stuck, like this. This typewriter is a cool feature where it has this key marked KR, which is key release. Push that, it'll unjam them. On every other typewriter I have, you just have to do it with your fingers like that. Margin release key. Okay, so on a typewriter, you're at the left margin, and then as you make your way across, it will ding about five or so, six spaces out from the very end. And if you're typing, you'll hit the end and won't let you type anymore. Now, when you hear the ding, you need to either end the word or hyphenate it. Um, but if you just can't get the space to, you hit the end, you hit this key, MR, margin release. It'll be, it'll be marked somehow like that. When you press margin release, it lets you keep typing. It actually works on the other side too. If you wanted to type early, you know, it, that can be handy if you're doing something other than just a straightforward page of text. 
many desktop typewriters like this will have a margin set button lever somewhere. This one has it on the keyboard. Some will have it up here. It'll be marked like magic margin that's on royals or margin set or something like that. Some of them are spring loaded. So if you press the, if you put it into the left position, the left margin will just snap to wherever you have this set. So right now, left margin is right there. On this typewriter, you have to go to the margin, press uh, KMC. I don't know what that stands for on this typewriter, but that's the margin set key on this one. And then you move it to where you want the margin to be, release that, and then that's where the margin goes to. And then if you want to set it back, you just press down the key, move the margin back to where you want it to be, and then it'll be set there. Okay, another thing to know is uh, that tab works differently on a typewriter. It's called the tabulator bar. Most of them, a lot of desktop ones have a bar, some portables have a button on some side for the tab. Um, on a typewriter, it moves however many spaces you set it to. So you can see it does about five there, five, that was 10. And you set the margin or the uh, tab with these two buttons that can be anywhere on here, but tab clear and tab set. Tab set is just where you want the tab to stop when you press it. And then if you have one of those sets, like right now that's at 40. Press tab clear, you can hear it click. Okay, so if I want to, I can use the tab clear, go through, and clear all those tabs. Now, if I press the tabulator bar, it'll go all the way to the... Next up is the touch regulator. Um, this is a really cool feature that exists on typewriters that doesn't exist at all on computers, and is kind of an example of use-specific design that's been lost on computers because of just the different way they work, and then people just kind of forgot about it. The touch uh, regulator controls how hard you have to press the keys to type. Um, on this typewriter, it's right here on the front, so that's easiest, and that makes the keys heavier, just depending on what your preferred feel is. Um, it's not usually right on the front on a typewriter. Uh, often, to see it on a typewriter, you'll have to pull this off, and you'll see a slider or something with like one through 10. Um, sometimes it's like a wheel on the side right here. Um, but if you see anything that's like numbered one through 10, that's probably a touch regulator. Not all have it, but a lot do. And it's just kind of a cool feature. So on, if you have a desktop typewriter like this and then a portable, desktops are usually feel a little bit heavier to type on. So you can have the desktop set to the lightest and you can adjust your portable to a heavier setting so that they both feel the same to type on. So then you're not like readjusting your feel. Um, kind of a cool thing. Um, it also aids, you know, just in reducing fatigue on your hands. Um, my personal feeling is that you get stress fatigue in your hands a bit less with a typewriter because your hands are moving so much more. It's not small movements, um, so your hands, it's you get less repetitive motion stress. Um, this can also help with that because then you're not doing the, you can mix it up sometimes and not be doing the exact same all, thing always. Next up is the ribbon indicator. I'll show you this on a different typewriter next, um, but if you have a multicolor ribbon in here, this will change the color that you're typing with. Uh, this typewriter only has a black ribbon in it right now, so I just leave it set to black because um, it won't do anything other than that. One exception is that you can make it type nothing. Um, so there it's typing. There it's not lifting the ribbon, so it doesn't type anything. Um, th there's not a whole lot of uses for this, especially if you're not like doing things like it was for stenciling, uh, which is a thing that I'll, I'm not gonna get into because it's obsolete and you just won't end up, you would never end up using a typewriter for that now because none of the other, none of the uses for it exist anymore. Uh, but also like, 
if you don't have paper in the typewriter and you just want to click away for a second and I'm just on the roller, um, set it to the nothing so you at least aren't leaving literal type on the uh, on the platen, which is the roller. There's another control, which is the ribbon reverse. This is a control that you don't need to worry about. Um, if your typewriter doesn't have quite the right ribbon in it, sometimes, it, so the ribbon is on these two spools. Um, and it just, while you type, you can see it moving. While you type, it just winds from one to the other. When it hits the end, it should reverse and start going the other direction. If you don't have the right ribbon that doesn't isn't compatible with your typewriter, for whatever reason, I'll explain that in a different video, uh, you might find that it hits the end and then the ribbon, you'll like notice that the typewriter gets tight feeling um, and then the ribbon will get tight and it's because it's not reversing and it's just hit the end. So if that happens, which is shouldn't happen is unusual flip the ribbon reverse this can be anywhere sometimes it's hidden inside the typewriter sometimes it's right here sometimes it's over here but it's just a two position lever so it's pretty easy to identify it and you also just won't end up touching it very much now we're moving up to the carriage controls this is the carriage it's what moves side to side there it the most important part of it is the carriage return and line space lever. This is your return key. What you do, you push it, it'll move up a space, and you just push it all the way across to the margin. It's really easy. Sometimes I'll see people like do that and wonder like, I don't know, I don't know what they're thinking when they do that, but you just drag it across. Uh, next up is the uh, variable line spacer. This is how you choose single, double, or triple spacing. Um, this is always in this spot. On typewriters, it's not always labeled one, two, three, and sometimes it only does single and double. Some of them do single, single and a half, and double. There's variability in that, but it's always right here. So it's easy to find, and you end up, that's one of the controls that you'll end up messing with the most often, probably, aside from the main keys. We've got, single space and then if we go double oops I don't know what I'm doing double so there we go that's what that looks like like I said this is called the platen this is the roller the rubber roller um, most of them are hard at this point. They're not supposed to be squishy, but they should have like some grip so the paper doesn't slide. Most typewriters, the rubber has just kind of hardened and isn't as grippy as it should be. You can get these redone. I'll talk about that in another video too, although I've never had it done to one of my typewriters because it just, it hasn't been that big of an issue for me. There, okay, so next up in terms of Levers you'll use a lot uh, left and right carriage release levers you, The carriage can always move To the right freely move it to the left or if you just want to move it to any around There are these two levers. They release the indexing mechanism that spaces like that Just makes it so you can move this wherever you want so if you're trying to line up with something on a page, if you're doing a form, something like that, you can just line this up wherever you want it to be. This typewriter has an additional uh, feature that's another one that's kind of irrelevant, but you could originally have different platens that were different hardnesses for like making copies uh, with carbon paper and stuff. This typewriter has a quick release lever. Um, which is kind of cool, uh, but there's no, you don't make, I don't even know if you can buy the right like papers and things to make copies with typewriters anymore. I honestly don't know. On this typewriter, there's an indicator right here that tells you if it's all the way engaged or not, turns red if it's not. I've never seen that on another typewriter. 
most typewriters it's more involved to get the platen out and some of them you can't without actual like disassembly this one you can uh one thing is on portable typewriters usually and some desktop models the margin set isn't on the keyboard you have to set the margins up here i'll show you that on a portable typewriter in a minute another feature is the uh, variable line space button um, on this typewriter it's a button on some typewriters you pull the button out on other portables you pull the whole knob and it clicks outward and what that does as you can see this is indexed for each line right now if you push that in and this is this is if you have the most common use for this is if you have taken a sheet of paper like this out and then you want to put it back in and type on it. Now, often your type won't line up perfectly what was already there. Push this button, it moves smoothly, and wherever you release it, it's indexed to that line. So you want to take the line of text, take the bottoms of the letters, and line them up with this bar right here, like that. and now the type is lined up. So that's what you use this for. There's a similar lever that is the line release lever, it's this one. If you flip it forward, it seems like it does the same thing, but the difference is, is that when you release it, it'll re-index to the way it was before you pulled the lever. So you can see if I put this between lines, it'll index back. This one you, I, you don't use very often unless you like literally just have one word that you want to free form put in a spot. I, I don't really know exactly why you would use it over just adjusting the overall indexing. Uh, one thing is, is that if you do this, the space lever doesn't do anything. If you pull that, the space lever actually does still move things one space, two space, three space, but then you release it and it will like read. Another thing to know is the paper guide. It's this right here. Some typewriters will have a line that you're supposed to align it with for a regular eight and a half by 11 sheet. Um, this typewriter is numbered in such a way that the center of an eight and a half by 11 sheet is marked right there if you line this up. On most typewriters, you set this to zero, which will be somewhere right here. And then when you do that, that's just, you, you line the paper up with it when you put it in. So you can see what I've, you've noticed me doing this is you line it up with that and then you roll it in. That just makes sure that all your pages are consistent and that your margins are in the right spots. Because if you put the paper in crooked, the margins are gonna be in the wrong spot on the paper. This piece is called the paper bale. Uh, usually it can pull forward like that and also flip up. Um, on portables, it often can only flip up, but it just keeps the, the paper pressed down so that it types cleanly. And also like you'll notice if I type on it like this, it's really loud. So that's another reason to like make sure that you're using it right. The only thing is that when you go to put the paper in, just pull it forward, then the paper rolls in and you close it like that. Or, you know, put it up and then close it. Um, these rollers can be moved around. I keep them towards the edges, but you can put them wherever you want. Um, just as long as they're holding the paper down. There's also various scales. So this typewriter has a scale marked right here. For when you're putting the paper in, it also has a scale handily on the paper bale. And then it has, all typewriters have a scale down here, which looks like you wouldn't be able to see it, but there's actually in, right in here, there is a pointer and it tells you exactly at what point um, across the carriage you are at. Um, these scales all line up. So when you are setting the margins and whatnot, or setting tab stops. That's how you can count out exactly five spaces, 10 spaces, whatever you wanna do is by using that. Or if you're centering things uh, on this typewriter, 
you center to that. Those scales come in a lot of handy too. One of the last pieces to know, at least on a desktop typewriter that will be up on the carriage, is the uh, feed roller release, which is this lever. It's on every typewriter I've used, it's on this side. It has a lot of travel, so it's pretty distinctly different from the carriage release. Also, everything will start sliding. When you want to just pull a sheet of paper out, you don't, don't do that. What you do, pull that, it loosens the feed rollers on the bottom, and then the paper slides out freely. For this next part, my uh, microphone was flaking out while I recorded the original audio. So now it's a few months later and I will be trying to figure out what on earth I was talking about based on the weird hand gestures I make. So this section I'll be talking about um, other parts and mechanisms and things uh, related to typewriters, mostly related to portables, but I'll also co cover things like corrections and whatnot. The typewriter I'll be using is a 1934 Smith Corona flat top portable. Um, I really love this typewriter. It's a really pretty color. Um, anyway, so here we go. So you stick the uh, case on the desk, and then to get the typewriter out, you have to push down a release lever. Um, some portables have two release levers, sometimes it's on the front of the case, whatever. So you lift the typewriter up, pull it forward to get it off of the hook that holds the back down, and then you can set it on the table. Um, not all portables come out of the case, some from the 20s are permanently attached to the bottom. Um, so what you want to do if you want to type on your lap is you can slide the top of the case off or release it but they always release somehow. Um, so you can release the top of the case and then you have the you leave the typewriter in the bottom and you can have that on your lap so you don't get your pants in the typewriter mechanism. But we want this on the desk, so I'll leave it there. This typewriter also, the uh, carriage return lever um, is folded down so you have to fold it up and then the carriage itself on a portable will always be locked when it's in the case. To keep it from sliding around and getting damaged. You can see that the spacebar and the keys don't do anything right now. On this typewriter you just push it to the right to release the carriage lock and then you can see that's that little lever I'm pushing on the bottom of the carriage. You hold that down and then slide it over and it locks in the center position. That lever is in a different spot on typewriters all the time and it's annoying but to find it but it, it is there. Um, here you can see the margin sets. There is no margin set key on this typewriter. So those you just push the button down and slide the margin to where you want it to be. And there's little indications on that bar that tell you where it is. Um, here is the tab key. Not all portables have a tab key, but this one does. Um, and then you have to set the tab manually by literally moving those tabs to where you want the tab stops to be. So it isn't a, you don't push a button to set where the tab is, you have to just move those little tabs around. Who knows what this means? Um, now we'll be putting paper in. Um, portable typewriters have these uh, paper holders that flip up. I don't know why full-size desktop typewriters don't have those, but it just helps to keep the uh, paper from folding over the back of the typewriter while you're typing, and it helps you see what you're writing better, because you can see the whole page at once. Um, the This portable doesn't have a paper bale that you have to move to get the uh, paper in, uh, it just has little tabs that stick up, and then uh, on the right here is the color select, and the left lever is the ribbon reverser in case the ribbon doesn't reverse on its own when you get to the end. Here I am just demonstrating switching the ribbon colors. It's a little hard to see on the video, but that's how you do it. Um, something else to be aware of is you can see that some of the letters on this look a little fatter than others. 
What that is is just gunk from the ribbon building up on the type slugs, which is what the part that actually hits the ribbon and the paper. Um, so you'll notice that some letters will start to fill in, especially E's. I'll do the hand gesture for that here in a minute, I think. <laughs> um, that's the type slug right there, that thing. And so when it starts to get gummed up with just crud from striking the ribbon a million times, um, hollow spaces on the letters start to fill in and the letters start to get fatter and then the type just kind of looks messier. There we go, there's me gesturing about an E filling in. Um, so you can clean those out by just taking like an old toothbrush, dipping it in some rubbing alcohol, and then just toothbrushing the type slugs. Just be careful to not have that alcohol spray onto the paint of the typewriter because it can damage it. Um, but yeah, you just toothbrush those and, you know, dip the toothbrush and the, you know, rinse it out a few times and just toothbrush it off and then just dab them off with a paper towel. And that will take all the crud out and then the type will be really clean and look almost printed after that. Um, it's just kind of a regular thing that you have to do. I believe I'm talking about how the backspace and tab keys are often reversed on typewriters. They're kind of never in the same spot. Same with margin release. Um, caps lock on this typewriter requires that you push down the same shift key that the caps lock is on, basically. Um, it's not like the bigger Remington where you can release it from either side. Here's just the inside of the typewriter. Um, I have original spools in here that I rewrapped a new ribbon onto. Um, this, this type of ribbon has eyelets in the ends that pull a lever when the ribbon gets to an end and that's what makes it reverse. It's not the same mechanism on all typewriters, but the one with eyelets is the most common and that's what this typewriter uses. So there's like these loops that are just past the spools that you want to make sure that the ribbon goes through when you put it in so that they can be pulled by the eyelet at the end. On this typewriter, to make the to release the solid spacing, um, you pull the left knob outward, and then the line spacing itself is set with this lever on top. It's not marked, but it's in the same spot on almost every typewriter. And there you can see the the kind of prongs that hold the paper down on this typewriter instead of having a uh, paper bale that moves. Here I'm talking about how uh, there is no one key on most typewriters. You press an o a lowercase l to act as the one. Um, the typeface is designed so that one and l look the same. Um, so to type 100 you do l00, just kind of an odd typewriter goofiness. Um, and then also to do an exclamation, you do apostrophe and then you backspace and then put a period under it. Um, there's no exclamation point that would be on the one key if there was one, but there isn't. It does take a bit of muscle memory to remember that the apostrophe is over the eight. Um, and then to make it even more confusing, some newer typewriters from like the 70s have an apostrophe where it would be on a new computer keyboard. Um, so kind of all of the basic QWERTY UEOP is always the same, but where all of the ancillary uh, characters are is kind of different on almost every typewriter. So if you're working on a few different typewriters, you end up just developing muscle memory for each individual one. And I often don't even realize that I've automatically switched to where a apostrophe is on a different keyboard but it does take a second if you've spent your whole life only typing on one keyboard layout. There's also, for some reason, one quarter, one half, and three quarters keys. I've, I don't know why those were more important than having something like cents, but actually this one does have cents, I think, but it, they, I don't know why those were more necessary than just having a one key. Right. Here we're switching over to 
a 1910s Underwood number no. five. Um, this is a really, really satisfying typewriter to type on. Um, they're also less expensive than other typewriters from a similar era uh, because they were the most popular ones. So they are pretty common to find still. Uh, you would pay probably 75 to 100 for one that hasn't been cleaned or restored. Restored, I have no idea what you'd pay quite a bit, but you know, a, a different typewriter from the same era, you might pay 150 or more for one that's, you know, dirty and unrestored. So they're kind of a good starter if you really are attached to that like early 1900s. It's got lots of pinstriping and really pretty gold leaf effects on it. It's also a basket shift, and, or a, uh, a carriage shift instead of a basket shift. Basket shift is when the keys move up, or the uh, strikers move up and down to shift, and then uh, carriage shift is when the carriage moves up and down instead. Basket shift is better. That's probably the only thing I don't like about this typewriter is that it is carriage shift. It makes the shift keys just really heavy. But it's really solidly built. It's smaller than most desktop machines, which is kind of also nice because it just fits into spaces easier. It's it's it is when they you see it side by side with a more modern in quotes ba um, machine, it looks really tiny. It's also got really good er ergonomic design, even though it kind of looks like a sharp cube. Um, your key fingers just fall really naturally on certain controls. Like that, the uh, carriage control you can see me demonstrating. You just, yeah, your fingers automatically go to the right places. That's the same control for releasing the line spacing. And then this typewriter also doesn't have a movable paper bale. It has, it also has prongs just kind of in a different orientation to hold the paper down which just makes it different from typewriters made in like the 30s and later. Actually, all of the controls on this typewriter are pretty different compared to one from 19, 1930s and on. Um, the older ones have a tog like a shift toggling lever for the uh, ribbon color. This one just has um, a little knob that you slide side to side. Um, the backspace is on the left here, demonstrating that it's in a different spot from that portable, um, and then the tab is on the right. Um, there are the tab stops are manually set on the back, sort of similar to the portable typewriter, except they just don't come completely off. You just um, pull them out and slide them, and then the margin set on this typewriter is actually you can see the ruler on the very front of it and it's those levers below that ruler set the margin on this typewriter which is different from pretty much any other typewriter I've used. This typewriter has an interesting thing where it's a really good demonstration of kind of some of the ergonomics of typewriters. It puts more force into your fingers when you type than you put into the key in the first place. It does that using the force of the mainspring that you wind with each return. But right here, it's spacing on its own with me just putting the weight of my finger on it. Because my finger pushes the spacebar down, but then it pushes the spacebar back up harder than I pushed it down in the first place. So it can just kind of loop on its own. And it kind of helps bounce your fingers back up to their starting position with each, each key. I think that would be a really amazing thing if key, computer keyboards had that if they kind of bounced your fingers back up to the starting position. This little thing I think is just for holding cards down if you're typing cards. Same with those two triangular pointer looking pieces. Um, those also are just card holders for any paper that isn't big enough to reach the uh, rollers on the sides. Fortunately on this typewriter the uh, platen, the roller itself is in really good shape for the age. It still has some kind of rubbery sheen to it. It is pretty hard but it does grip the paper. On a lot of typewriters this old the platen kind of just completely started cracking and falling apart. Okay so here I'm going to demonstrate 
my favorite way to make corrections while you're typing on a typewriter. There are other ways to do it, um, but I like these um, type correction tabs is usually, the, that's the term you can find them with the easiest usually. Um, you can see all sorts of letters typed on there and it's because when you make a mistake, you slide the tab down in and then type the mistake letters and it will white them out. It smacks, um, there's almost like white out, dry white out on the back side of the tab. And so when you type the mistake letters, it just retypes them in white on top of the black, which makes them go away. And then you can type the correct thing over the top of that white uh, pigment. Um, it's really clean and you often can't even see that you made a mistake at all which is much better than trying to use whiteout, which will makes a, you know, makes a big glob on the paper. You can see it really easily and the typewriter doesn't type clean on top of it. Um, and then my least favorite way to make corrections that unfortunately was also really common in the past is to use ink erasers, where you literally erase the mistake off the paper that tears up the paper, makes it thin, and also fills the typewriter with eraser crumbs that glue to everything and then harden. And so the bane of my existence is cleaning those out of typewriters. So I, I never ever use that option for make correcting mistakes. Uh, the uh, typewriter correction tabs are the way to go. I don't know if they're made anymore, but there are plenty of new old stock ones that are available on the internet. Or if you're lucky, you'll get a typewriter like a portable typewriter with a bunch of them in the case, as is the case for me. I think I'm typing, talking about typing position here, um, having your hands down versus up and posture and whatever. Typewriters do kind of lend themselves automatically to having, you know, the uh, the correct taut typing posture just because they you can't have your hands be super lazy while you're using them. Here I'm just kind of showing the ergonomics of it. It's just, it comes really naturally to grab the carriage in the right position when you're trying to move it. Same with the paper release. It's like curved in a way that is just really comfortable on your fingers, even though it doesn't really look like it. So it just kind of goes to show that good ergonomic design isn't a new discovery. It's always existed. It just doesn't, you know, necessarily look like an organic shape in the past. Here you can see the basket ship, or the, um, the carriage shift mechanism versus a basket shift. Uh, on a basket shift, the that you can see the basket of keys there would be going up and down when I pressed shift. But on a carriage shift, the carriage has to get lifted by the shift key, which makes it heavier. So there we have it. That's how to use a typewriter. Sorry about the end of this with some tef technical difficulties, but uh, hopefully this video was informative for you. I kind of tried to put everything I could think of into it. I'm sure there will be something I've forgotten though. Anyway, good luck using your new typewriter.